Um, hopefully, it's pretty light and easy. Um, the hardest part I found with this was figuring out how to use the markdown and share again and all of the slide stuff. That was somewhat complicated. All right, you should be, I think you should be good now. Let's all right. And I just started recording, by the way, uh, just so you all know. Um, uh, all right. Okay, um, so yeah, so my name is Josh, and we're going to talk about chapter two today, names and values. I'll figure out how to, there we go. So things we're going to talk about, uh, distinctions between names and values, when R makes a copy and how to track them, how much memory uh, an object actually occupies. This is somewhat different from um, what you probably were taught if you just used basic utils. Exceptions to the copy on modify paradigm. Um, that's when copies are made. And the garbage collector. Hey, uh, Sorry to interrupt you. I only see like a sliver of your screen right now. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, it's like uh, like a, a, a fifth. Of, there we go. Yeah, that's better. This is better. So I have, I have two screens going, and one of them is on my laptop. So let's see if this works better. If I go full screen, can you guys see that okay? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll. That's super better than that. Um, all right, uh, so yeah, so back to the outline for you. Um, can you see my cursor or no? Yep. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, as I was saying, and then the garbage collector is the last thing. One of the things that they talk on, about in the chapter was uh, non-semantic naming. Um, I didn't think that that was particularly necessary. It was really kind of just shoehorned in there. If we do want to talk about it, we can talk about it at the end, but um, basically, don't put weird characters at the beginning of your names of stuff. Otherwise, R is going to rename them, and it's going to make your life harder. That's kind of the the, the all for that. Uh, we're going to use the lobster package throughout this, so um, you will have to download that if you're going to follow along. So the first thing is this motivating example here. Uh, it should be pretty simple and straightforward. If anyone has used R before, we're just making a vector. And uh, that vector is values one, two, three, and it's going to be named x. So intuitively, I think, you know, oh, we're just creating x and it has values one, two, and three. Well, not really. Um, we're actually creating an object that's a vector with values one, two, and three, and we're binding it uh, to a name, and that name is x. So it's kind of like, in a sense, we have some naming and we have some object, and then they're bound together. Uh, this is done for uh, optimization purposes uh, so that we can reuse objects uh, with different names. We're going to use this kind of uh, diagrams that are from the book all along as we go. So this is kind of the purple boxes are names, arrows are bindings, objects are uh, some kind of structure, and usually they have a reference, which is just kind of an artificial address. <clears throat> So yeah, so if we follow along this example, and now we kind of duplicate y, or sorry, x to y, uh, are we creating a copy of it? Well, actually, R is smart enough to kind of save memory for us, and they just make a new name and point that name to the same object that x was pointed to. And we can check this by using the object address uh, function from Lobster. So Running it here, we have both the address for x and y, and we can see that they have the same code. So uh, we do, in fact, only have one object that we've created. Now, what happens if we were to modify y? Uh, the same thing would hold if we modify x, but we're going to modify y. So if we change the third item um, in x to 4, well, what's going to happen? Well, x is not different. Y, y was modified, X was not modified. So X is still one, two, and three. And we're actually creating a copy of X and then we're modifying it. So copy on modify is this, uh, is this paradigm. So we've actually now got two items or two objects, uh, one which it has a binding to X and one which has a binding to Y and they're one, two, three, and one, two, four. So what happens is when we modify an object, it creates a copy, or will create a copy for us. And it tries to find the most efficient ways to 
uh, make this uh, copying. So it only copies as much as it has to based on the structure of your object. Okay, and we can use object address here again to see that they now have different, although very difficult to tell if they're different, very different, uh, they, they're slightly different addresses now. Uh, <clears throat> and so there's a cool function, so, somewhat annoying if you leave it on and it just runs all the time, uh, which I did accidentally with some code I was running by myself yesterday. Uh, but there's this trace mem function and it will tell you every time you've made a copy. And so basically what happens if we follow the same example we did before and we make the third item in uh, Y a, a integer of four, well, we're gonna now get this prompt that says, hey, you made a modification and now you've uh, caused a copy. Uh, don't worry about this stuff at the end. I couldn't get rid of it when I was trying to do this, but basically you only have to really worry about this, which is saying that you had an address and you now made a copy and it, that it's the copy now lives here, okay? Uh, cool thing is that R is smart enough uh, to not make another copy if you just modify Y. And that's because it's one of the few exceptions to the copy uh, on modify paradigm, which is that if it has a single binding, uh, which is to say there's only one thing that points to that vector, it's not gonna make a copy. It's just gonna modify it in place, All right? Uh, so we can use that here. Uh, so we just change it to the integer five instead. It doesn't give us a prompt. Uh, and then uh, most importantly, make sure to turn off your tracing at the end uh, so you don't have a for loop that's just giving you an infinite number of spit outs uh, and then you're shamed, you know? Uh, that's, that's what else would happen to me, so. Uh, the next thing that's kind of interesting is that like we should look at the different types of objects and how they're stored because that actually has a lot of implications to when copying occurs. Lists being, um, one of the primary ones, and if, if I understand the book properly, they're probably gonna drive us to use lists more than we, we want to because they're objects that have a lot of flexibility. And lists themselves, you know, this list looks a lot like what our vector did. Uh, you know, it's just the elements one, two, and three. But in this case, uh, a list is actually a set of pointers to objects themselves. So uh, the list itself is a uh, collection of pointers and those pointers are then giving us the, the values. So uh, the object, or sorry, the diagram here kind of gives that description, which just says, hey, we're pointing the first cell, or the first item in the list is pointing to one, the second item is pointing to two, the right is pointing to three. Um, and so then uh, if we were to copy this, you know, we make another uh, list, L2, well, it's actually just gonna point to the same um, set of pointers and then we're all good. Uh, but what happens when we modify it? So if we modify the list, so we change the uh, third value of L2, well, we're actually gonna share the, <clears throat> the objects one and two, and we're just gonna create a new set of pointers for L2, and then we're going to have a new object for that it's gonna have another pointer to. So we're actually sharing more data here than we were in the uh, case with the two vectors. The two vectors, we had uh, to replicate um, the two vectors in totality. Here, we're not doing that. We're actually just creating one new object uh, at the integer form. And we can check this out. It's, this is useful for lists, uh, which is the ref function from Lobster. And so if we look at the uh, L1 and L2, so our two lists, we can see where the, uh, what the addresses are for each of the uh, objects within it. So the list object, that's the holder, so this is L1. And then its references are to L2, the three doubles, uh, one, two, and three. So we get the three doubles here. And they're just enumerated by, you know, basically from this, uh, oops, sorry. And then uh, we have L2, which is the second list. And then uh, it's actually sharing one and two. So it has the same addresses for those. And then it goes to, uh, there's another uh, object, another double, which is pointing to, which is uh, object six here, okay? So <clears throat> this is a good way to see what you're sharing between lists. Uh, I didn't find time to use this in my real world uh, coding this week. I didn't think that there was an opportunity for it, but it may be interesting if you're trying to care, uh, see where you are sharing data if you do find that you have kind of exploding lists at any point. So the next one is, uh, is data frames. Data frames are lists of vectors, so they have a little more structure than uh, generic lists. And there's an important consequence of it being vectors 
uh, mostly with how you uh, modify the data. Uh, so it has a similar diagram here. We're going to have two vectors, uh, x and y, one, two, or sorry, one, five, six, two, four, three. And, you know, it works the same way as our listed before, but now it's pointing to the two vectors rather than pointing to the individual uh, doubles. And so what happens uh, if we were to duplicate it and modify it? Well, if we modify columns, right, we can still share columns because it's each vector is, uh, is a column. So D1 here is using the two columns we had before, great. And D2, it's copied over the first column, but it's made a new copy of the, uh, for a, the, its new second column. So it's made another object, but it's still sharing uh, that first vector. So this is useful because, you know, we don't have to recreate all of that data uh, for both columns when we're copying, we're, we can still share some. Where this gets tricky and, uh, why row-wise calculations are not particularly useful or not particularly fast, I guess, is that if we were to modify a row instead, well, now if we make D3, which is a modification of the first row, we have to create two new vectors because both of those columns have been changed, both those vectors have been changed, so we now have to duplicate all the data. So we've actually increased the amount of memory we've used and we had to do two copy operations. So when you're working, uh, it's more efficient to have, you know, to operate on columns rather than operating on rows. Uh, I have this problem consistently through my work where I, 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 I shame my bad code because I've written it so that I'm doing row operations and then I'm, it blows up in time and then I say, oh, I shouldn't have done it this way. So this is, this is under the hood to why things are so slow. And the last one we'll talk about is, uh, is character vectors. And they're kind of interesting because they're essentially, uh, vectors in the same sense that we had before, but instead of having um, objects that are uh, integers or doubles, they're, this, uh, they're strings. And the string pool is, is actually global. So once you've defined a string once, it's always going to point to that version of that string. So here we have x being a, 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 b, c, and d. Well, it's only going to create one version of a, and then it's going to point the second value uh, to be that same one. So it shares everything as much as it can. This saves us in times where if you have the same name over and over and over again. Uh, so if you have a data set with names, maybe if you have, you know, same person, same person, Peter all the time, then uh, it's only going to point to it once, which is good because it's not going to blow up your memory. Uh, and we can see this uh, in actually how much memory is used. Uh, just a simple example here. Um, X being that A, 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 B, C, and D, it takes up 248 bits, uh, and D itself takes up 112. Now, if we were to concatenate um, another copy of D onto the end of that, it only takes up 264. That's because there's an additional 16 bits for another pointer, but there's no more bits for creating another copy of D. So it, it does save us uh, some uh, size, although you know 16 bits isn't going to get you too far. <clears throat> So then, um, I guess at that point, is there any questions about copy on modify or anything that you guys saw in the chapter that were confusing for that? Uh, Josh, uh, yep. do, um, with the strings, is the length of a string, it, does that affect at all the memory used? So what was that, the length? Yeah, the length of the string. Like is ABC using more than A? I, I, th I think so. I, I think because it has to do more encoding. I, I haven't tried, but my assumption is that the longer the string is, the more memory it takes up. But I think it's you know not a huge amount. Um, yeah, that's just my my guess from my vague computer science knowledge. Um, but yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just say if you have any computer science knowledge, you have more than I do. So I'm <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we could easily check it. Um, you know, uh, afterwards, because we could just try making one and using ob size and seeing. Any other questions? All right. Um, <clears throat> so, oh, oh, sorry, I just have one. I, have, uh, sure. uh, I was wondering, there was an example in the book where there was like a copy on modify. It was like one of the exercises and um, they were showing an example where they had like, uh, like I think it was long integers, like 1L, 2L, yeah. thing, and and like it, it was the same object, but it did make a, a copy. And they were like, why did that happen? And 
don't know if you remember that one. I yeah. can talk about it at the end, but I was just really confused by that. I didn't know. I, I, I guess, like, I was like, well, the only difference here, it seems, is the is the type of value, but I wasn't yeah. sure. Yeah. I, I think that's why, because I think it had to, I'm wondering if it had to create, like, if it has some kind of forcing, like if one of your values is an integer in a vector, all of them have to be integers. And then so it caused a, it caused a copy to be created. Whereas in the other case, uh, like, like I think it was like you had Y and it had a single binding, right? I think that's the case. And so it's like, if you go from one, two, three to one, two, four, it's fine because it, it doesn't have to make a copy because um, it knows it's a single binding. But maybe there's some circumstance where like, if you change the type, it has to create a copy. I think that's what it's implying, but um, yeah, I, I also thought that they, they, it would be nice if the exercises were fully explained as to what was happening. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was hoping for like also, yeah, like an answer in the next section or something, but I think yeah. it's so. all right. Cool. Just yeah. curious if. No, no, yeah. I mean, I think that was my, my, my justification to myself was that it was because it was integer and it had to copy, the, uh, it had to change the other values. So it made a, a copy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, cool. All right. And we can play with around with it later or something too. Yeah. Josh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, um, so I did try what you suggested with object size and uh, 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 strings of different length and any string between one and seven characters is 112 bytes. And then it goes up to 120 bytes with eight characters. And any string between eight and 15 is 120 bytes. So it's adding eight bytes for, I guess, every iteration of eight. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So I guess it must have, like, it, yeah, it must be built in some way that that's optimal, that it has, you know, it, each byte has to be, it can arrange them that way, but it needs a minimum amount. Yeah. Right. Cool. <clears throat> Um, so we've been using obj size this whole time uh, and not uh, the utils object dot size. And uh, they make a point of saying that you shouldn't use object dot size, uh, mostly for the case of lists. And they leave it to an exercise, but I, I pulled it up here. Um, if you look at the documentation for object size, <clears throat> it says it should be reasonably accurate for atomic vectors, but it does not detect if elements in a list are shared. So in our previous examples, even a data frame, we had some, we can have shared vectors in that. And so if you run object size on it, it's gonna assume that each vector is unique. And it's gonna say, okay, well, you know, um, it, doesn't put, it doesn't have two pointers to the same thing or a list is the same way, it doesn't point to the same object twice. So it doesn't understand that you could be actually having, you know, the same, you, you could have uh, duplications of value. So if you were to say, just same, copy the same um, column multiple times, it's going to make your object size bigger, but uh, it's not going to make your obj size as much bigger because it's just going to add another pointer rather than another vector altogether to its calculation. And uh, that's what we get here actually with this example. They use a list, not a, a, a data frame, but what we have is a thousand um, random numbers and we repeat that a hundred times. And so <clears throat> if we were to look at this, it's the same 1000 uh, numbers, but if you use object that size, it thinks they're all unique. So it's a hundred times bigger uh, by its, by its uh, estimation. And so object size is, or obj size is gonna be a, a more accurate estimate for anything with lists involved in it. Um, I didn't know this prior to this, so I, I'm now happy to, to have this information when I'm uh, looking over to see what's taking up so much space. <clears throat> so we did talk about uh, copy on modify, but there are a couple of exceptions to that rule. Um, the first being what we talked about before, the single bindings. And the second one, which is going to come up uh, more often later in, I think, chapter 7 and chapter 16, um, is environments. And so environments are a special type of object and they're always just modified in place. And the cool thing, I guess, with this that we'll revisit sometime when we know much more about the inner workings of R uh, and advanced functionality is uh, that it can be uh, used as a function that remembers previous state. Um, I don't fully understand uh, what this is gonna do, but you know, uh, that's, that, that's how they describe it. So 
if we were to create uh, an environment um, with the values one, two, and three, so kind of a dictionary, uh, A is one, B is two, and C is three, <coughs> and um, we make a copy of that, which is E2, we see that they both point to the same environment, and inside that environment they have names, and those names point to those um, objects. So essentially it's just like a little microcosm of what we had before. Now, if we were to modify E1 to have a different um, value C, so it's kind of like our same toy example we've had before, the third value that we were talking about. Well, now what happens is both E1 and E2, they're both gonna point to four. So they, they both, in a sense, are um, using the same set of pointers and three is kind of marooned here, okay? It would be garbage, uh, which we're gonna talk about in a second. Um, any questions about modify in place? I was just curious oh. about, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I just had a quick question. Like I, it's a basic question about these diagrams. I don't yeah. really, is this saying that like the values are actually stored somewhere outside of the environment? Like, uh, I, like I think that's the implication here is that there's like a, a value store or something like the, the values are in one place and the environment is, it is uh, holding the names themselves. I see. So it's yeah. like independent of the environment somehow. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, the values are, yeah. The na I think the environment is uh, a set of names and pointers hmm. to values. Cool. I mean, hopefully we learn more about the structure later, but I haven't, I haven't dug into what environments are that much. Cool, all right, yeah, I'm just curious, thanks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So in that last example, we had that value three, which was now kind of, it was uh, unaddressed as it were. Um, and uh, that's a value that we may try and remove. And this is where the garbage collector and unbinding uh, comes up. So another toy example here, we have the value one, two, three. While we change that value to, or sorry, we have X, which is one, two, three, it's a single binding. Now we change X to uh, two through four. Well, that one, two, and three, it just sits there on its own. It's now been made, but it's uh, separate, and it doesn't have any pointing to it. And X is now pointed to two, three, four. And if we remove X, we're actually just removing the pointer of X. We're not actually removing the object. Uh, so one, two, three, and two, three, four are just sitting there in our memory with no binding. So there's no way for us to reference them, but they're in our memory, okay? And <clears throat> this is presumably not ideal. We would like to have everything that we're trying to use be usable, uh, but the garbage collector will take care of that for us when we need them. So essentially it's not going to perform these operations of removing things unless we actually need to remove them to do some future operation. Uh, so they will get deleted by the garbage collector. The garbage collector only frees up memory um, when it needs to. It doesn't uh, free up memory if it doesn't have to create new objects, okay? And there's really not any good reason to call the garbage collector, although I see that everywhere and sadly in my code I have some GCs hiding throughout uh, every once in a while. And the two reasons why you might is that um, you want to ask it to return memory so that you can use it by another part of your operating system. I have this happen sometimes where I have really large tables inside of uh, a loop and I want to get rid of those um, I've parallelized things and I've, I've made terrible mistakes that I feel bad for. Um, <clears throat> but in those cases, I use the garbage collector so that I get rid of some of the objects that I had throughout the way. Um, if I make a secondary data table or something and I want to get rid of it so that I'm not um, having kind of a, a big data leakage problem. I don't think this is the ideal solution and I hopefully this, you know, if we use rows and columns correctly with our modifications, we don't have this problem as much. Um, but definitely, uh, I am someone who's used garbage collector incorrectly. And the other time that you might want to use the garbage collector is um, to check how much memory is being used. And they able, it's like uh, it shows um, how many physical cells and virtual cells are being used by the memory. And it's kind of not a very stable if you use the garbage collector to look at how much memory you have. It would be, sorry, my internet connection is unstable, hopefully. Okay, um, let me know if I cut out, just uh, wanna make sure I'm not um, causing trouble. 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, so the memory used is actually, if you use the lobster version, it'll just show you the memory that you've used. So it's a much simpler and cleaner approach. So uh, I would recommend that, um, at, even though it is actually um, calling garbage collector inside itself. So it, you're not getting away from the garbage collector, but it's an easier way to read. Uh, and that's all I had for today. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think we can discuss any part of this. And if there were some parts of the exercises that were confusing, we can definitely um, go over those as well. Uh, I was wondering, I just sort of glanced at the part about the garbage collector, like when will I ever use this? But um, do you think that means if you create a big data frame um, you know, with one name, then use that name to refer to something else. Does that mean your big data frame is just sort of clunking around in the, um, in your memory somewhere and you can never like, Yeah, uh, I wonder, I, because all of this is very pointed towards you're modifying something, not kind of marooning a whole, um, data frame. I mean, I, I don't know if it's recoverable, the objects, like, you know, the, the different vectors that are within that data frame, because uh, they have no pointers to them. Yeah. Um, I think what it's trying to imply here is that you don't actually need to, it may be sitting there, that large data frame, um, but you don't need, as long as the garbage collector can run, right, it knows how much memory exists and that it needs, that your next operation that needs memory, it knows to run to get rid of old memory. As long as it can do that operation, you're fine. Um, the example I keep coming to, to why I've had to use it was that I had um, a parallelized set of apply statements. And in that, I think I was marooning some data frames like you were, you were just talking about. And I don't know if the garbage collector could realize that like it was taking up more memory than it thought it, like it, it thought it could allocate more memory than it could. And so then I, I was like, just completely saturating my RAM. Like I had no, it wasn't going to work. So I, I was on every like 10th, I was making it, I was, ran a counter and every 10th time I made a garbage collect on purpose so that it would like get rid of the chat. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I don't think that's what we're supposed to do though. I think we're just supposed to write smarter code. And so, yeah, that passage, I, I think it's, a, I'm having trouble resolving it because it, it, it's saying you never need to run garbage collector, but you may want to run garbage collector. And what you're describing is a situation where you wanted to, it sounded like you needed to. <laughs> and, and yeah, we'd all like to write perfect code, but I don't know, is it implying that if you have to run garbage collector, you're doing something wrong with your code? I, I mean, it, it may, uh... It may be the case that, um, yeah, like you've you've written something in an inelegant way, and uh, because of that, you're you're likely that you're you're running against a wall, and you shouldn't be resolving it with the crutch that is garbage collector. You probably have some better solution. Has anyone else had an example like this where they found that they were overusing memory, and then they found an alternate solution that was better than garbage collecting? I've certainly exhausted memory, but I've never used the GC function. I wasn't really aware of it. It was mainly that I was not, I was not um, pre-assigning memory while uh, building a huge vector uh, or yeah. some a loop, and which is a is a you know, not really a rookie mistake, but like a second year mistake. And uh, uh, you know, finally I figured out what I was doing wrong. But I, that was just an, iter an iteration problem. Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely had experiences like that with loops where if you're not um, careful, you start creating things that are much larger than you anticipated. And, you know, I think some of the stuff that we have here, some of these tools with the, you know, where you're checking when copying is occurring and object sizes are definitely ways that you can check your code on a loop and say, okay, well, I'm actually creating four copies here when I didn't intend to. And with that, you can, you know, you can start to pare it down better. Um, yeah, it's definitely one of the areas I'm going to take from this back to my uh, my work code, which is to say, like, if things start getting slow, let's start looking at what we're doing here and, and, and optimize through memory usage rather than 
you know, just uh, running the garbage collector all the time and, you know, lowering number of cores you use and just, you know, waiting longer. None of that's really the best, of, um, the best course of action. Yeah, I feel like in the past I've had cases where I've like removed old objects from the environment, uh, but I don't, I'm not sure what that does in the context of memory. Like, does it just remove the, the name that's pointing to an object or is it like, it does feel like it's freeing up memory, but uh, I don't know. It seems different than the garbage collector. I'm not really. Yeah. So I, what I think is happening is it's removing the pointer for those objects. And then if nothing's pointing to that object, the next time you assign something, it frees up that memory for, for you to use for your next action. So it's running the garbage collector for you in that sense. I see. So it's like you're, you're giving it permission to get that out of the, to kind of clean it out of the way yeah. using remove. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. I just learned about local last week, or okay. actually earlier, maybe it was earlier this week. I started with the, the first cohort, um, but they were much further into the book, and I decided that I wanted to start from the beginning with you guys. Um, the local is pretty cool because it's, it, it's similar to a function where you can have like all those, those steps inside because, you know, with the curly braces, you can do yeah. like multiple steps. Um, so it's like all that happens inside local but then the result gets assigned to the value. So it, it, it hmm, I don't know if I'm explaining it well, but so if, if like, if to get to like the data frame I'm trying to make, I need to like row bind three other data frames, mm -hmm. instead of making data frame one, data frame two, data frame three, and then row binding them and then removing data frame one, two, and three, because I don't need them anymore. Right. You could just put those steps inside local and then the data frame result will just be the output of that, but it doesn't actually, I don't think it saves those other variables. It's kind I of like see. a low, it, it's pretty cool. I, I want to explore a little more, um, but I have a feeling that could help with garbage collecting because it doesn't keep keep the object is my guess. Yeah. I don't know how to test it. Like I, I'm not sure what <laughs> I need to do to test it. Yeah, so. well, I, yeah, it might be one of those cases where if you tried like looking at your memory sign before and after with both of them, with the only thing changing is local versus function, maybe you'd see the, the difference there. Um, there is some times where you don't get assignment for functions and that's kind of, I, I think, it's kind of halfway to what you're talking about, which is like, it doesn't assign anything, right? Like, you know, the, the function is not a loop of code in that sense when you're using local, you're, you're saying that it's actually, all those operations occur and the only thing that is saved uh, to your, you know, to your normal environment is the final result. Correct, yeah. Um, that seems safer. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any uh, comments or questions about the rest of the chapter? Um, any of the exercises or things that we didn't talk about here? Um, I, I think one. you did a really good job. Oh, I think you did a really good job going yeah. over it. And the, yeah, the nice. slides were really easy to follow. Yeah, luckily, Thanks. you know, for whoever does the next one, uh, we have the slides from the first cohort. So like, if you're like, I have no idea how to describe this thing, you can look at that and then, yeah. you know, they have at least a good idea of it. Um, go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, uh, so I was wondering, so I'm looking in the, I wanna, that's actually not an exercise. It's the description of, um, of this loop that's taking a while. Yeah. Um, that uh, that we're trying to resolve, and so he um, he does trace mem, um, and we see like all the copying. And yeah. I was trying to wrap my head around like exactly um, what these like where these copies are exactly occurring, if that makes sense. And I was wondering if anyone else fully got that. Um, like he sort of explains it. Uh, and I gather that it's like the use of, the, it's like these index functions basically. Um, but 
I wish I could direct you to a page number, but it's in. Um, yeah, it's I know in, exactly what you're talking about because okay, that 2. was 5 definitely 5 the most confusing right part. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so I was wondering. So in each iteration of the loop, I guess it's it's copying this x three times, and I and I got that he's saying he says below that one of them is like an increment of the. One of them is an one of them is an increment of um, the reference count of x, which I assume means the number of bindings to it. Or does this, does someone know? Is it a regular function? Yeah, I didn't fully uh, follow this part, and it was one example that I was hoping we discussed, and someone might have a better uh, understanding than I did. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was pretty slick that you could just change it to a, a, a list and it, it was like resolved in no time. Yeah, I just have no idea why. Well, I, I, I get I get why, but I guess, but like, um, yeah. I feel like some of this, there's some, some jargon in this paragraph, in this like one sentence came out of nowhere. So I don't know if anyone has a better grasp on it. Um, yeah but I was trying to figure out exactly what was happening. And so like clearly one of the, so ignoring the reference increment thing, mm -hmm. one of the copies is, you know, you're changing X. Um, but the second copy is something else. And I'm not sure what it is. I think what's going on is X is a data frame that's returning um, like a numeric value, and then medians. Does that does that change? Um, does that change the the type or no? Like the v apply. Mm -hmm. What what is numeric one? one oh one? yeah, I didn't know. Is that rounding? Is that uh, rounding? So yeah, v apply gives it. Oh, sorry. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I think you're right because this is v apply gives it a restricted. Um, type of value on the outcome, which is it's a numeric one. So so I think what's happening is X is one is one is that a class then? Is one class and then medians is a different class and then you subtract them so it like needs to switch the class yeah. again. Okay. So that's the three steps. So it's okay, so oh so it, it's the same anomaly then as like the double trace mem thing where it we assigned it instead of like an integer, we gave it a numeric and it was like, why does this copying twice? But it's, okay, so it's some data type change and then some reference count increment, I don't know what that means. Yeah, <laughs> it assigns it and then it's got some reference thing that we don't fully understand. Yeah. Sorry, but I don't see the reference, the type change. Because like, the apply is like, it's a, the result would be a numerical vector. I don't think it will change the. Yeah, I it's like you just I don't see like you. You saying like I think that's like you have. It's like this, the previous example when you have two. Okay, sorry, I have no idea, but I just don't see like I think the apply it gives a numerical vector two. All the operations are among numerical vectors, like each element of x is a numerical vector, so x. X one X XI XI and median XI are on merits, right? Yeah, I guess we were thinking that maybe it had some restriction to what it was based on this part, but I've never used V apply, so I don't know enough about the objects types. Is someone trying this? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So the result of medians is just a vector length five because it's the medians of the five columns. Yeah. Um, so he takes that matrix and then says n call five. So you get x1, x2, 
through five as, as column names. I, I don't know what numeric one does, but. Hmm. We're at least relatively sure about one out of three copies though. So, you know, we're doing all right. Yeah, it seems like, yeah. So it seems like these all are all numeric. So V of play just requires a third argument. And it looks like you can just put the number one in there and it works. I'm not fully clear on how that, that function works. It, it says it's, there's an argument called fun value. Yeah. Which I think is, um, oh. I yeah, think it's, it's like it. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. No, I think that's give a template for the return value. So I think it's just to keep sure that the result is a numeric. It's like to keep it from changing like to an integer. I see. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. So as for we don't have a better uh, answer. So my other theory- So I'm sorry, we're trying to figure out like why we get three. Yeah. We just, so so when 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 it does x minus medians, is that going to copy? And then it's going to copy again when it assigns. Could that be it, or does that not make sense? Well, I guess so, maybe oh, does it have to make a copy to make the medians and x part? It has to make a it has to make a vector for that purpose. Let's see what happens. That sounds reasonable. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out like what how I could verify that, but I also yeah. you know, you, we, we don't all have to say it. <laughs> so we could we we, we may potentially spend enough time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this was definitely the example that was the most confusing to me throughout the uh, chapter. I also didn't get what he said about the functions. Like some functions in R are primitive functions, but I was like, what is happening? I think it's just before this part. Mm -hmm. He talks about that we don't always know when the copy occurs because some functions doesn't, don't work as the others, but like how functions, why? Which functions I have no idea. I think it's... Okay. It's in 2.51. 2.51, okay. Yeah. When still, uh, whenever you call the vast majority of functions, it makes a reference to the objects. The only exception are especially written primitive C functions. It's the only be written by our core and occur mostly in the base package. So it doesn't occur. Like uh, there are a lot of primitive functions. Sometimes I like I see a uh, read on CSV or data frame, and there's like primitive. It, it calls a primitive function. Yeah. So I found very confusing this part too. Yeah, my guess is that if it's written in C, um, then it's not going to create a reference to the object. Right. It's 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 not allocating memory in the same way, and most and that we really shouldn't have to worry about, I guess, was, was his comment here. Uh, at least that's how I read it to be. Um, did you find it just, like, have you found something to be the opposite, that you're, you're worried about memory on, uh, on read.csv or anything like that? No, no, it's like, yeah. no, it's just like, I want to know more about primitive functions. Like, it just said that, okay, if I have primitive functions, you don't know when copy occurs. But I was like, okay, how, what is a primitive function? When they usually occur? It's like, it's yeah. just out there, this information. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, my understanding of R is that it's built on C. And so some of the optimizations are built on C. And so things that are not built like from derivative R building blocks, but which are built by the core team based at made out of C, 
and are optimized such, they're not going to create reference objects because it's not really operating in the same way within the system. Um, but I don't know, like, can, can we write things in C and then have those be act as primitive functions? I, I'm not totally sure. I've never tried to write something in C for R. Uh, me neither, and sorry for changes. Change oh, no, that's the okay. subject, I think. Oh, okay. I had a classmate once who was writing things in Fortran for R, and I don't understand why he was possibly doing that, but um, that was, you know, five or six years ago. And so that's the only experience I ever have with someone trying to write other languages to make R work properly. I can tell you a story about Fortran though. Um, so I used to work at the Congressional Budget Office and their whole, their like population and like, oh, their whole social security model is um, all in Fortran. So they're like, they like desperately try to like recruit people who know Fortran because they haven't converted it over. And that's like, like one of the two major social security projections for the US. It's like. Congressional Budget Office and Social Security Administration, and the CBO one is 100% in Fortran. <laughs> Still, and that was true as of a year ago. So, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, those are always bad when there's a language that you know, like, is no longer in vogue, and you have to have people do that to uh, to keep something running. That was the the reason for the project that we had that my uh, colleague was doing in Fortran was our advisor had written all of uh, this code to run the spectrum estimation um, method that he had created in Fortran. And so he had to take that code and like port over parts of it so it could actually be applied in R so we can make a package. And he spent like two years of his PhD working on that, <laughs> which not a very effective use of his time. I just put a link in the chat of um, like lists of primitive functions. I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I don't know if there's a way to predict if the function's primitive or not, but this, this does have a list. Um, and I, I will say if you if you do question mark dot internal, there's there's some something kind of funny in the help menu. Uh, I'll let you guys find that on your own. Um, <clears throat> um. Basically says that uh, it's only for wizards. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. I feel like uh, every time I would go to the R, um, the R like forums or uh, the the boards for R, it was that's pretty much everyone's definition of what it's like. Oh, you have a problem? Well, that's you're just not good enough at R. That's yeah. So it's good we're getting away from that. Yeah, that was right. I thought it was kind of funny at that, like towards the end of the chat or to, in 2.5, he's like, well, if you are doing weird things to avoid copies, write, rewrite your function in C++. So I'm like, all right, I'll go ahead and do that. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, were there any questions or comments that someone else had or anybody had on the chapter? I just had a general comment, like uh, with um, the whole piece about uh, character vectors, like having that like efficiency where if you have the same character, like string kind of repeated, it'll just like point to the same uh, reference, the same value and not like duplicate memory. I was just like, I was like playing around with lists and I was wondering why lists don't do the same thing. Like if, if like I have, uh, the same number repeated or the same like a string like a, a, a like it'll be a different memory reference each time um, you know like I I was just I, I was just curious like why it seems like it like it could be it would be more efficient I mean obviously I'm just like spitballing here yeah. but, like I was just if anyone had any thoughts about like why that might be uh, it's just I don't know. Maybe it does for integers. I read once about Python. That Python does this about integers. So it always points to the same integers. 
it all it also had a tutorial how we can change the value of an integer in Python. Like you can make eight be four, like which you you shouldn't do. But like maybe R does, R does the same. It seems logical. Like you have all the they have the most common integers stored. Like you don't have to call one or two or three every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I guess I was talking about just like like. Specifically with strings, like if I did that, can I just, is it cool if I share my screen for a second? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, like with, um, maybe that. So like if I have this here, right, like it'll have the same reference twice for X in memory. But then if I have that same thing, but in a list, uh, like each, X is a different reference. Yeah, that's just yeah specifically what I was. Does it look the same way with character equals true on? Oh, here. Well, that just gives me one memory address for like the vector. I think. Oh no, I, I meant no for the. Uh, oh, far. Sorry for. For the bottom one, yeah. Oh, here. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So it's just the pointer. The pointer is the character thing you're getting there and the actual uh, global string pool is the same. Huh, okay, cool. So if yeah. I had something with integers, would that be like, or is it only with strings? Like if I had one, one, three or something. I don't know. Let's see. Like, I think if, if call one, you call a numeric or an integer? If it's just one. That's a numeric. Yeah, an integer would be with the L at the end, right? But I don't know if it, it may treat integers as some unique thing, but here as doubles, it's pointing to the same reference, it looks like. So well, this here, it's slightly different, I think. Let's see. Three B. Oh, eight, God, it's a B and it's a four. Wow. Three, four, eight, yeah. It's like so similar, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Like one letter. Yeah. So I guess in the creation, it doesn't know that those are the same. Mm -hmm. Would you try if think integers, just like special. Like, go ahead. Oh, just like if he could try if it integers, like one L, one L, three L. Yeah, same thing. Different, different references. Yeah, I don't know. I guess the answer is that I don't know, like character character factors and global string pools are just different. I don't know. Yeah, I guess that's what it's saying is that the global string pool it knows it it checks and knows those are all the same references. It don't it tries to only make sure there's one copy of each character. Um, object. Yeah. Whereas it doesn't do that same kind of smart work here. Do you yeah. have X saved? If you if you say list X X X in line two fifty six, can you make those X's? Oh yeah. Yeah, I think I do have X. Uh, yep. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, but it's something different. One second. I was fooling around with the other example. Uh, Okay. Yes. Yeah, so so the, there's a reference to two twice, right? So it's just saying it's showing the same structure as above, but then replicating it two more times at the bottom. Can't say it's easy to read, but yeah. Yeah, I, think that's yeah, what, I, know. I think that's what it's doing. It's hard to follow. Like, I think I think it's so it's like referencing the entire vector in this two line here, and then it's saying that the vector is copied two more times, but it's the same address. Yeah. 
and then the individual strings that are in that vector, uh, since X is there twice in the vector, it's also referencing the same uh, address for the X's, the X strings. Yeah. It seems uh, relevant to what I was saying about uh, data frames being lists of vectors. And so if you are, if you're modifying a column, it's less disruptive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in this case, we're actually, we, we, we're creating less references too, which like we're only creating references, not new copies of those values. Um, I think in a data frame, even if you had the same values, one, two, three for X and one, two, three for Y, it's still gonna have to point to two vectors, one, two, three, once and one, two, three again. I don't think it's gonna make one copy and point them towards the same thing. Um, Yeah, I think that I think that's how it works. I'm going to say in dark, like if you use a darker theme, at least I think I'm using cobalt. It grays out when they repeat. <laughs> it's a little easier to follow. Good tip. Yeah. Um. I guess a couple of notes about the for presenting in the next or in the future. We have a template that was given to us by the first cohort, um, and it's relatively easy to follow. Uh, it works pretty well. Um, if you do pull down my slides, if you're trying to follow them, I added some extra CSS objects just because I wanted to have different column widths when I had two sets of uh, stuff beside each other in a slide. Uh, that was just taken from the internet where someone had done something like that, just kind of hacked away at it a little bit. Um, so that's stuff that you can use. It's all pretty well set up there. Um, yeah, so I, I, whomever's presenting in the future, hopefully that's easy enough to, to follow along with the slides that they have set up. Awesome, thanks. Um, and you did a pull request for that, right? Uh, yeah. I think they should, people, it should like, yeah, be up there in the next day or so. Um, yeah, they were asking me if I wanted to update the README, so I, I tried okay. to figure that out too and then and then send that back. Cool. Um, by the way, I realized that there are a few people here who weren't in the, you know, the first group and we did introductions last time. Is anyone who, who wasn't in the first group want to quickly just introduce themselves? Sorry, I should have done this at the beginning, but uh, just say like, who you are and you know uh what you what you want to get out of this uh something of that nature just so that everyone knows who you are um i'll i'll go i um yeah so i wasn't here last week um but who am i uh so my name's ezra um i actually work with jake who's sheepishly grinning <laughs> he 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 told me about this um and yeah i'm like uh so i'm an analyst um at at CHOP at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, sorry if Jake, you were secretly concealing where you worked. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm like a an old time user of R because it was a thing I like learned in college. And then I went to a job where I had to use SAS all the time. So I did that for a while and now I'm kind of back to R. So I've used it like on and off in an analyst -y kind of way. Um, but I like to know what's going on and like kind of what's under the hood. So this seemed like a cool way to kind of learn that stuff um, and like get some more skills around that. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Chris here. Um, I'm in Los Angeles, data, ana data analyst. Um, I learned R at my last position, um, but just, you know, just enough to do what we needed to do and, uh, just kind of hack our way through problems. And so, um, 
I know R, but I don't really know what's going on with it. And so I thought uh, deepening my understanding of it would, you know, push my um, use of it uh, to, to the next level. Awesome. Welcome. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'll go ahead. Uh, I'm Mike. I did miss last week's session, but uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully attending uh, most of the rest. I, um, unlike I think many of you, I'm not trained in computer science or a data analyst. I, my training is in uh, neuroscience and uh, particularly uh, uh, genomics, transcriptomics, uh, um, sequence data. And for uh, handling made large data sets, I had to start learning R a few years ago. And so it's been not just learning the language, but learning the concepts, which I think some of you have some, have some familiarity with, but uh, are, are really, um, even the jargon sometimes escapes me. Um, but I, you know, I'm trying to grasp the concepts uh, and I use R a lot, not just in work, but in uh, um, you know fun applications as well, like tracking my fantasy baseball team. And um, so um, I'm going to be asking a lot of stupid questions. Uh, but um, I noticed in the first cohort that they they're just bombing each other with questions, and I mean it's the only way to push through. Uh, so. Be patient, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, and uh, at one point or another, I will, I will present. But um, I, I think I'm going to see what some of you, know, some of you with more chops can, can tell the group first. Oh, I should also mention um, uh, I'm, I'm American, but I live in Mexico. So I work for a Mexican university. I've been living in New Mexico for about 20 years. Uh, and one of the things that I really appreciate about R is a sort of democratization of, of use and knowledge. You know, the fact that it's open source, generally free, I feel like it's something that can really lower barriers to entry for a lot of people who would normally feel inhibited about doing data science, about uh, writing code. And so a lot of what I do at the university is I really try to encourage students, younger researchers to just, you know, uh, try to try, give it a try. If you have any questions, let me know. We'll work it out together. If I don't know, I'll Google it. But um, it's something that, uh, you know, kind of in a late stage career uh, rejuvenation, I really feel like it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun um, um, you know, using these tools, learning how to use these tools and learning how to, you know, hand them off and say, you know, you can stop using Excel. You can stop using SAS or SPSS. You know, you, there are better ways. Uh, and when, you know, I think when, when people find those, those ways, sometimes they, they, they get inspired too. And they, you know, they, especially if you just, you know, turn it right, a pipeline right to ggplot and, you know, show something pretty and they're like, hey, okay, this is, this, this is better than Excel. I can see how. Great, welcome. I I, uh, I saw something on Twitter today. Tom Mock posted that was like talking about like the power of like learning out loud and just I I feel like that's a lot of what we're doing. And uh, I don't know. I I think there's no judgment with like questions and uh, uh, you know I I think feel free to share your thought process about things and work through things together. I think that's what's fun about this. So so yeah, but thanks and welcome. Um, all right, anyone, anyone else? I think that might be everyone. Uh, anyone else who wasn't here last week? Uh, cool. Okay, um, awesome. Well, I think we should probably wrap up. I mean, it's a little bit over an hour. Um, sound good, everyone? Uh, we have a, a presenter for uh, next week, um, but we don't have anyone for the week after. Um, so let me just look it up. Sorry. Uh, next week. Uh, um, so that would be, yeah. So two weeks, that'd be chapter, uh, chapter four. Right. Um, so if anyone would like to do that, uh, you can say it now or either just like, or, or, um, post on the Slack and, 
or do a pull request even. Um, if you add your do a pull request and add yourself to the schedule, um, then uh, for upcoming meetings, then uh, for our cohort, then uh, you'll be on there. And um, yeah, um, so either way, we can probably, we just take it to Slack. That's easier. Um, but um, but yeah, and then if if no one signed up by next week, I'll just ask again and try to figure out if who wants to do who wants to go. So all right. Uh, uh, and I'll just I'll bite the bullet. Uh, I'll do I'll do chapter four. Um, okay. No purposes, but uh, uh, you know, just looking through it, uh, I should be able to to put something together in a couple weeks. Sweet. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, and will you, will you, could you just, uh, will you be able to do a pull request to write your name in there for that? It's actually already on the calendar on the GitHub. So, um, um, so what would I be doing? I'd be pulling the calendar, modifying it and pushing it again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So just, there's a readme. It's on the readme on the, on this, um, on just the Vanstar, uh, repo. Um, I just put the link in. Um, so yeah, let me know. Uh, I actually, yeah, I just did that for something else, um, for my slides for last week, uh, and, uh, figured out how to do it. The one tricky thing that I realized is that since this repo is actually, it's not an organization, it's like a R for data science user. You have to fork it to your own repository, uh, and then clone it and then make the modifications and push the changes before you do a pull request to your own repository. That makes sense. Um, so anyway, if you, if you get caught on that, just let me know and I'll try to help. Yeah. But yeah, anyone else have anything? Uh, all right. Well, this is awesome. Uh, thanks again, Josh for presenting and everyone for coming is, uh, a lot of fun and hope to see you all next week. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Josh.